we'd start marking them in the morning and wouldn't get any bites. And I'm freaking out. I'm like, my guys, we're doing something wrong. What's going on here? Why aren't they biting? You know, we can't get them to bite. And like at 1030, they snapped and they bit all afternoon. But from daylight to 1030, we're marking the same amount of fish, just not getting any bites. And then they just, they turned on. I mean, I don't know what triggers it. And how did it start out? Like, what was the origin story? Too much alcohol. Really? Okay. <laughs> Because if God wanted us to have fiberglass boats, he would have given us fiberglass trees. It's it's for fishermen. It's not for taking the wife and the wife's friends. It's, I think that it's a really, really pretty bit. And then there was a blur that went by and ended up in the cockpit, as yeah. far as if I can remember uh -huh. correctly. <laughs> Welcome back, State of Sport Fishing Podcast. I'm Nick Carullo. I'm joined with me, my co-host, Anthony Pino with Hooked Optics and Captain of the Blood Money. Tonight... Our guest is Miles Coley, uh, captain of the Cheeseburger, a 60s Scully out of Past Christian, Mississippi. Uh, thanks for joining us, Miles. Yeah, glad to be here. Looking forward to it. Yeah, man. Uh, so, Miles, just give us a little intro about yourself and uh, kind of how you got started. Yeah, I kind of grew up fishing, you know, with my family, my dad, my uncle, cousins and whatnot, um, you know, fishing local piers and King Michael, and, you know, Benita, whatever we catch on the piers. Um, worked in tackle store while I was in high school, did a little freelancing on charter boats and uh, got out of school and uh, started working on some charter boats and uh, freelancing a little bit on the private boats and um, decided that's what I wanted to do, you know, I wanted to be offshore and marlin fishing, tuna fishing. So kind of went that route and been doing it ever since. Nice. You've been based uh, out of the Gulf Coast the whole time? Or most yeah, of the time, Miles? Pensacola, Florida, yeah. Um, you know, we fished around – you know, the whole Gulf Coast, anywhere from Panama City over to Venice, Louisiana. You know, we kind of run that whole tournament circuit along through there and um, made a couple trips out of the country, you know, the Bahamas and DR a couple times, but nothing, nothing serious. Gotcha. Yep. Um, so, and then you ran before this boat, you're on a 72 Viking? Yeah, born, the Born, born to run. run. Yep. Yep. We had, um, was with that family for almost seven years. Uh, we had a real good run. We had, um, Built two boats with them, two 72 Vikings, and they had a 63 Hatters when I started with them. Uh, we did a lot of fun fishing, you know, a lot of tournament fishing. I mean, we fished pretty hard. Um, the owner was retired, and they were local, and anytime we had a good weather window, they were game to go. So it was a lot of fun. So got a lot of fish for those guys. Nice. And, uh, yep. What happened? They got they get they get rid of the boat, or you decided to yeah, go a different yeah, route? Yeah, no, they they uh they decided to get out. They were just um, I don't know, I guess ready for something different. Um, so they sold the boat, and um, uh, you know, I'm still good friends with them. Talked to Dana, which was the owner, every day. I mean, we well, he's texting me a few minutes ago. So um, no hard feelings there. Had great times with them. It was just you know one of those things. They were ready to try something different, I guess, and um, ready to move on. You guys had some some success on that boat. Uh, let's uh let's talk about just the the overall scene in the Gulf Coast. We you're one of the I think we've only had one other Gulf Coast guy on on, and he was in Port Port Aransas. But you you you've done the the whole tournament scene there a lot. Tell us yeah, about that, yeah. man. The the style of fishing it's it's really unique to that area. Yeah, it's kind of evolved over the years. I guess the last ten years now, it's been mostly live baiting. Um, you know, live bait and blue marlins around the oil rigs, or now we've got a few fads around some uh, some bottom structures. So that's nice, kind of splits it up a little bit. But it's um, you know, we bought into the live bait and thing pretty early on, and I've uh, been doing that pretty extensively for about ten years. And you know, it's a it's a a long long trip. You know, we leave on Thursday afternoon and we run offshore, usually 100, 150 miles or so, sometimes two hundred. Um, catch bait. Bait's always the issue. Um, just like, I mean, you know, selfish or whatever, like Nick does, but you know, it's always who, who has the bait, who can catch the bait. You know, we can't pin bait up for weeks at a time. We've got to catch it, you know, as we fish. And, um, you know, we've, we've done well with that Your tuna tube systems. We've kind of fine tuned that we figured out a you know recipe that works for us with pumps and inlets and the number of tubes we can hold and all that type of thing. Um, but it's, you know, it's not, you know, people just say you catch a bait, you throw it out around a rig, you catch a blue marlin. It's not quite that easy. I mean, it's, it's a little bit more to it, but, uh, you know, it's, it's fun. It's, it can be slow. I mean, you may go all day long or maybe all the time get one bite, but you know, there's trips where, you know, you just hammer them too. So do you have times when you just, just the bait isn't cooperating and you can't catch the right bait? It does happen. Um, we kind of look at this. I mean, there's two, two thoughts to that, you know, it was like, you spend the time, I mean, you may spend an hour or two trying to catch a bait. Um, but on the other hand, 
you may spend that same two hours dragging lures around, not getting a bite. So you just kind of like, you gotta, yeah. you gotta figure out the time when it's worth putting in the, t- the effort to catch the bait versus just throwing some plugs out and hoping to get bit. Um, it gets difficult sometimes. And there's cer- certain times, certain areas and certain times of year that you can't lie bait or you can't have a bait out because of the sharks or the barracudas or the grass or whatever it is. So you got to switch over to lure fishing or teaser fishing, but we try to really focus on the live bait. When did, did you, so originally when you guys started running out to the oil rigs like years and years ago, you would almost exclusively lure fish and then it kind of started to, started switching to the live bathing around the, around the rigs a little bit more. Yeah, at some so, point. I mean, I mean, yeah, and when I you know started fishing out there, all we did, you know, we'd throw five or six plugs out and drag around, do circles around a rig, and you get, you know, you get some bites and catch a few fish. And, but you know, I, I guess I sucked at lure fishing. I don't know, but we, I, I distinctly remember the tournament that we just kind of like, hey, this is we got to do something different. We uh, we were over for four on Blue Marlin by like nine o'clock that morning. I mean, just getting bit up. We we're in the right spot. Couldn't keep them plugged up. I mean, just you know, get them on clear everything, fish out there, jump, and comes off. And I remember climbing out of the tower, going down there, and just had a team meeting with the, the guys. I was like, look, we've got to do something different. This is just not working. You know, keep doing the same things, you're going to get the same result. So uh, that tournament, we decided to, all right, we're going to catch bait. We're going to put them out. And we caught a fish that way. We ended up catching a fish on a pitch later on because um, we couldn't catch bait. We didn't have the tube system back then to keep a bunch of baits all day. Um so from that point on, we just really committed to like, all right, we're going to do this live bait thing. Because when you hook them on a circle hook, you know, most of the time you're going to catch the fish. It's not like dragging a big plug around and they run out there and jump off. You know, it sucks. You just soar them out. Were, and you didn't do anything. Were you one of the first guys to do that? Or did you like, did you see the wave coming? You started to see other boats do that. You saw the wave coming and you guys kind of were like, this is, this is the word. I think this is we, us and one other boat. Jason Buck on the done deal there were doing it and mm-hmm. we were doing it and we were kind of I don't know I'll say pioneers I mean people have been live baiting forever but I mean we just kind of committed to it and um really stuck with it you know um how many years ago say, was that would you say when you came down to the cockpit that day and said guys we gotta do something different how long ago was that oh man that's got to be let's say it was seven years on the born to run and then a couple of year uh 15 wow. 15 years ago wow. probably yeah yeah yeah, so I mean, that's, yeah, and we, that's a long and we time played ago. Around, we played around with a live bait a little bit before that. You know, we had a stack of two tubes, and, you know, they didn't work very well. But, I mean, we we, we played with a little bit because we were tuna fish. We were live bait, you know, we call hardtails, or y'all call blue runners, um, for the tunas. And every now and then, you'd have a blue marlin pile on there on a, you know, on a hardtail or blue runner or whatever. You know, it'd be cool. We'd run out there and jump off and, you know, chafe us off because you're using light leaders and whatnot. And I was like, man, just beef up her leader a little bit, you know, catch a little bigger bait and do it that way. But we never really a hundred percent committed to it. Then we'd still, we'd live bait a little bit in the morning and then we would uh, throw some lures out in the middle of the day and ride around and live bait a little bit more in the afternoon. But about 15 years ago, I'd say we really committed to it. And nice. what uh was it, would you say when you started doing that, how did like the rest of the fleet like adjust to that? Was it frowned upon or people were like open-minded to it? At first, everybody, no one really cared. I mean, everybody was just like, okay, whatever, they're doing that. You know, that's just what they're doing. And then as a few boats started doing well in the tournaments and it was the same boats every weekend, the same three or four boats that were live bait and winning most of the tournaments, then you got some pushback, you know, some traditional lure fishing guys that were like, oh, we, you know, we need to ban live bait, you know, yeah. <laughs> because they didn't have the tubes. They didn't know how to catch the bait. They didn't know how to rig them. They didn't, you know, they didn't want to put in the work that we put in to get to where we were. They just yeah. wanted to keep dragging around their six plugs and hope to get lucky. Yeah. So it's kind of like the sonar thing. I mean, it's just, you know, at first everybody's like, oh, ban sonars. Well, it used to be ban live bait. Yeah. So, they're still talking about before. ban the sonars, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> and live bait. <laughs> yeah. 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 So. Your two fisheries is pretty much caught on to the live baiting thing is, is you know, in the Gulf Coast and south, down here in South Florida, it's pretty much it. Up at home, we're still, we're still fighting it. It's, it's tooth and nail. Yeah. I got a buddy, a buddy of mine, a guy that fishes with me quite a bit. His, uh, his dad goes up there and fishes out of Virginia beach with the, um, I can't remember the name of the boat. He catches all the white marlins on the live baits up there. The rebel uh, probably. Yeah, that's it. The rebel. Yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting. I know it's frowned upon, but whatever, you know, it's, it's a controversy. That's for sure. I, I wouldn't say, you know, it's, it's, I, you know, if you want to go, go live in and that's fine with me, man. So it doesn't, doesn't bother. Yeah. It only really, the, the crazy, the interesting thing is, People have tried it up at home. It only really works in one one area. You know, there's some other areas where it can be effective, but it doesn't seem to be as effective in, in 
other areas or, or way out in deep water. So, yeah. um, but it, yeah, it's a, it's a Canyon and the fish and the bait are very concentrated, much like an oil rig or, you know, down here where, where Nick's got the, you know, the alleyway that they, the sails travel in, you know, yeah. and, up. and then once you get offshore of the canyons and the, and the hundred fathom line, it's a lot more open and you just got to cover some space. So, but yeah, yeah, it's interesting. yeah we went out, we went to the DR a couple of years ago. And um, somebody asked me when we got there, I was like, man, are y'all going to live bait when you get there? I was like, no, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to open that can of worms. I'm not going to be that <laughs> guy. You know I mean? Yeah. I come down here to get teaser bites, you know, I'm not, I mean, I do enough live baiting at home. I want to, you know, do something different. But Do you, um, do you, does anybody teaser fish in, in uh, there's in a the couple Gulf boats, there, there's yeah. a couple boats and it's, you know, if you had a really good, well, I shouldn't say that because there are some good crews around, but like somebody like, that is really dialed in with that style of fishing. I think they could do really well up here. I, uh, for instance, yeah. the chot or not the chot. What's it called? The Moncherie, Damon Schwest, and that he's got mm -hmm. a boat. And they're from Louisiana, you know. And they they fished the tournament circuit the last couple of years, and they've done well. And they live bait some, but they particularly, I mean, they mainly lure fish and, and teaser fish. Yeah, and, um, they've done well. And back before we live baited, I mean, we got plenty of bites lure fishing. I just sucked at. It. I could keep them plugged up, you know. I mean, I just had to do something different that worked for me. So, I mean, and there's a few boats yeah. around that, that lure fish, that, you know, not, not specifically pitch bait or teaser fish. They're just pulling plugs that, that do well. The Relentless Pursuit stands out as one of them. Um, there's a couple of them. So, there, I mean, it, you can do it. I mean, it's yeah. you just got to get good at it, you know. Got to put the work in. Gotcha. So, that makes sense. What is a, what's a, like, a, give us a day. Well, you guys don't fish day trips, so. Let's go like for, for a tournament miles. Like what, what's a tournament look like for you guys when it comes to, you know, gearing up, you hold, you you know, you, you got a, you were, or you were running a boat that carried a, a whole, whole bunch of fuel and then you load some more fuel on and then you look for other places to put some fuel. And then you, then you guys run out there into the middle, middle of nowhere, yeah. pretty, or not nowhere, but it's a long ways. You know, you're, you're, that's incredible what you guys, but tell us what is, what it's like to get, get, get kind of, rigged up and get the boat ready to go on a you know two or three day tournament stint yeah so i mean most of our tournaments um we leave on thursday anywhere from some of them let you leave as early as 11 a.m and some of them make you wait till you know four or five in the afternoon usually you're out before dark and it's um i mean you're fishing from the time you leave the dock i mean you can put lines in as soon as you leave if you choose so it's usually a boat race to you know wherever the hot bot was the, the last weekend or you know, whatever it was. And with the live baiting deal, it's hard to catch bait during the day. Like you can, but it's a lot easier to catch it before, you know, during, before daylight in the dark. So you want to be the first boat to the rig where you're going, because usually the first boat, first couple passes, you're going to catch a couple baits. Um, so like I said, that's a boat race. And depending on where we're leaving from, it's going to be a hundred mile to 200 mile run. When you say so, boat race, how hard are you guys running these boats <laughs> to, to get there for a hundred miles or so? Like maybe not a hundred percent, but come on. Well, a lot of guys, well, <laughs> there's some guys running at a hundred percent the shotgun start. Cause everybody's got to yeah, yeah. my boats faster than yours. But, uh, you know, once everybody kind of spreads out, you may back it down to 85, 90% somewhere in oh, there. Wow. Um, you're running pretty hard, but you, we usually, you know, the, the Viking that, that 72 it held 2,600 gallons. I think if I remember correctly. And, you know, we would carry just about every tournament, we carry two, 300 gallon bladders in the cockpit and one tournament we'd leave out of dust and we'd run all the way to Green Canyon, which is on the West side of the Mississippi river. We put a 500 gallon bladder on the bow, wow. which sucks. It's just, it's stressful and things up there moving around, you know, it's like, luckily I haven't lost one yet, but there's been several boats have had them go over the side or bust a hole in them. Or it's just, it's just, it sucks. So yeah. I try my best not to have to put the one on the bow, but the cockpit bladders, that's not a big deal. We've got that dialed in pretty good. We got quick disconnects in the cockpit, hit a switch. And I mean, it's, they're pumping almost as fast as you can burn it. So um, that's it. Just you know? so you're at, at 80, 85 percent on the seventy two yeah. Viking. <laughs> burning a hundred and shit, what were we burning at that speed? About one eighty, I think, an hour, wow. something yeah. like that. So uh, yeah, that works pretty good. So you're out there Thursday night. You get a couple hours of fishing in that evening, and then usually what happens is you just you run to the first rig that you think you can get a bite at, and then you're just you know hoping to get catch a fish that afternoon. If not, no big deal. You chug that night, when I say chug, you know, like eight, 10 knots, wherever you got to go to get to like, you know, plan A, you know, your, your, your number one pick. 
And then, um, fish, you know, fish there, get some bites or whatever you hang out. Depends on how far you are. You got to be back the next day, usually before dark, which is around seven or eight o'clock. So you leave Thursday at noon and you're back Saturday by eight and you never shut the motors off. You're, you're traveling the whole time. Usually how, sometimes, how do you, sometimes you get lucky you, and you land, sometimes you get lucky and you land on them the first day and you just never leave. But, yeah. um, that doesn't always happen. Um, how do you, uh, how do you deal with that as a captain? And then in, in, and a follow-up question, how do your mates deal with that as, as far as, like, sleeping and, you know, is it just wide open as hard as you can go for three days and then you... It used to be when we were younger and we were stupid and we'd stay up all night long tuna fishing. You know, we marlin fish all day and then we'd stay up all night chunking for tunas or live bait for tunas. It was, it was just a marathon, but um, we kind of got better at managing the crews and the owners. And so usually what happens is I run the boat until I just can't like I'm just like you know when I say I just can't I usually make it to around 11 30 11 11 30 at night and the on the born to run we had myself Tyler Maxwell was my first mate and then we had three other guys that were like part-time mates um and you know I mean they had other jobs you know they were didn't work yeah, yeah. on boats or anything but they would come fish with us and one of them was our camera guy slash cook and nighttime driver and the other two dudes Robert and Brian you know they were like help in the cockpit so my goal was to uh let the the, the cockpit guys sleep as much as they could because i mean they're you know they're working all day they're, they're wore out so i would drive till 11 11 30 doug would come up and take over and then actually we were very fortunate the owner of the boat dana and lisa his wife they would actually take a shift um so they would come up and do like the last couple hours so doug could get some rest but we just split up time and you know take shifts and the last boat we had was in a closed bridge. So I would sleep on the bridge, you know, radar alarm on, I could hear the VHF. I'm sitting there right there by them. So if something comes up, all I got to do is turn around and say, Hey, you know, something doesn't look right or get alarm going off or another boat on the radar or whatever. And they could wake me up and I could, you know, get up and check things out. It's hardcore. Yeah. That is, that's hardcore as it gets, dude. Yeah. Man, there, there are some, there are some guys out there that are way more hardcore than us. I mean, they would fish all night. You know, they don't have the, luckily everybody on our team would take a shift if need be, you know, and a lot of guys, mm-hmm. you know, the owners are like, Oh man, I pay him. He's going to drive all night. Yeah. You know, yeah. whatever. That sucks. But yeah. um, do you ever get blue Marlin bites at night? You know, we've had this discussion quite a bit, and I don't think blue marlin bite because as many people are tuna fishing or sword fishing, you think it would happen more often than it does. But I have heard of one of one or two that have been hooked, like not right at dusk, but you know, at night, you know, eleven, twelve o'clock yeah. at night. Um, but that's it. And you know, twenty something years of doing this, that's all I've only heard of two. So never seen one at night, never caught one, never hooked one. You know, we've seen sailfish in the lights at night when we're catching bait in the morning. Seen that happen a couple times, but never. Seen swordfish, obviously, but never any blue marlin. Never caught one, never hooked one. Wow, that's pretty. I mean, in the grand scheme of all the boats, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure you have a decent, a pretty solid network. You know, like as far as you know what's going on in the tournaments, or, or you know, over the course of all those years, like the cra- to think that they don't bite, like that you've only heard of a handful or at most over all the years you've been fishing over there. That's, that's pretty crazy. I followed one on the sonar a couple of years ago. The first year we had, it, I followed that fish for. I don't know, an hour or so, you know, we follow him, he'd come up, you know, look at the base, would bite and followed him all the way till dark. And he just absolutely disappeared. Like couldn't find him on the sonar. Don't know where he went. I was kind of curious to see what would happen. Cause I already, we, we talked about this. They don't bite at night. So what do they do? Where do they go? Just disappeared. I zoomed up, down, ranged yeah. out in. I could, I could not find this fish. I'd been following him for an hour. I had a bread trail for, I don't know, over a mile. Oh, wow. knew exactly where he was going could not find him i don't know where he went that's crazy so they just i don't turn into a pumpkin or something i don't know <laughs> i read a I, yeah i read a marlin magazine article said they do dive like way down there to swordfish area just recently so i don't know how it seems seemed up like it had some good evidence with it so satellite yeah. guys and stuff like that so i know the, the the buoy fishermen here and South Florida. Yeah, like they, they I, I do hear, you know, a handful caught at night on the buoy gear. And then how deep is that, Nick? I mean, they're, you know, they're out, they're in typically 1,600 to 1,800 feet of water. And, you know, those baits are probably, you know, I'd say on average 100 to, I don't know, 300 feet down. Yeah. So they're not terribly so they're, deep. Yeah. Interesting. It's not a lot, you know, but every, like, you know, I hear a couple of my buddies that do it a lot, you know, maybe they catch one a year or something doing it. Miles, do you find like if you're 
you know, if you feel like you're at the right right rig or the right spot or something like that, do you find that they they kick on at a can you kind of predict what time they're going to kick on in the morning, in the evening, middle of the, the day, you know? Um, I'm start, I'm I'm on my way to the DR right now and I'm trying to understand the whole major and minor thing. I don't know how much you know about that, but fishing like <laughs> up at home in in the mid-Atlantic, it's so vast like the idea of just finding them is typically good enough, you know, but where mm. in places like, um, where you're, you're kind of isolated on, on, on a floating structure, like in, uh, the Gulf coast of the, the DR, I'm starting to learn more about like when they, when they bite. Yeah. I haven't been able to pinpoint it. I know there's a major and a minor and I do look at it. I try not to travel during that time. I try to be fishing during that time. And I've got a really good friend of mine that gives me a hard time because he's like, man, you don't pay attention to any of that. And, but there is a time when they start biting and I have not figured out if it's a moon overhead below tide change. I, I can't pinpoint it, but there, there is a time that they start biting. Um, yeah. You know, last, or a couple of years ago in a tournament, we, we caught a bunch of them and we'd start marking them in the morning and wouldn't get any bites. And I'm freaking out. I'm like, my guys, we're doing something wrong. What's going on here? Why aren't they biting? You know, we can't get them to bite. And like at 1030, they snapped and they bit all afternoon. But from daylight to 1030, we're marking the same amount of fish, just not getting any bites. And then they just, they turned on. I mean, I don't know what triggers it. Um, you know, I don't know how you, if, uh, uh, how tide works that far offshore. I've never been able to figure that out. You know, I have tide changes. Um, but there are times when you notice the current picking up a little bit around the rig and you just see the life just start, you know, the little tunas are popping. There's bait on top. I mean, you just notice that like, all right, it's fixing to happen. Um, but I don't know what triggers it. I can't, I can't pinpoint that. So there's something there and yeah. I'm terrible at keeping a log book, but I mean, there's something to it. Yeah. There's something to it for sure. The, I'm you sure you see it with the sailfish lot, too. Nick. Oh yeah. We see it with sailfish. Uh, you see it in the Abacos in the Marlin tournaments there where, I mean, nobody, you know, maybe a couple handful of fish caught. And then like you said, 10, 30, 11, it's just the whole fleet. Everybody's hooked up and then completely shut off, you know, two, three hours, it's slow. I mean, like I said, a couple of fish here and there, and then all of a sudden, bam, it's on again. We were talking about it. Um, not this, I'm a nerd, and I listen to the Los Sueños tournaments, you know, the live radio feed. And oh, yeah. this last one was pretty slow, but the one before that, I mean, it's you're listening to it, and, you know, they're picking away a fish here, a fish there, and then just like, boom, boom, everybody's, you know, catching yeah. fish. You know, it's like, it seems especially common with the blue, with the, with the blue marlin. It seems like it, they, yeah. you'll, you'll hear a lot of people say hooked up at the same time. Yeah, pretty wild how that happens. Find that yeah, so it's interesting. And something. I'm not a very patient fisherman, Miles. <laughs> so driving around a fad market things, if it's not going to go on, I got to figure. I got to teach myself to be a little bit more patient if that's going to be the case. Yeah. Well, the first year I went, the, the only year. <laughs> yeah, the only year I went down there, I kind of had. I was marking them. You know, like man, how do we get these? I mean, they're marking them at 200, 250 feet, and like. Yeah, I mean, you see them stacked on the machine. You know they're there. And they're just not, raise, not raising them, not getting a bite out of them. Like, what do we do? Like, trying all kinds of crazy shit to get them to bite and, um, you know, leave and go to the next fad or whatever. And somebody comes up behind you and just catches three or four off of it. It's like, what? You know, it was just their time. Yeah. So interesting. Is that your experience too, Nick, there? Yeah. I mean, typically, you know, I find when you, at least for us, when you marked them deeper than 200, you weren't really getting bit uh, at all. But anything above, I mean, if you marked them above 180, you were getting bit, you know. Almost did you, did you, for sure. Did you find that they would move, move up at a, like a, a certain, you could wait them out or like, did you just move on? Sometimes you just, sometimes you just move on, but you know, but you know, then again, you know, there's so many fads, you know, don't really put too much effort into one fad, you know, you know, even if you mark a couple, you know, you do a few passes, if they don't bite, you just keep going, go to the next fad, yeah. you know. You know, there's a, too many fads for you to just kind of pound out one fad on for if you mark three fish on it, you know, don't go crazy. Yeah. There'll be more Got it. So, hungry ones. So, Miles, do you do any, you know, there's some decent white marlin fishing and, and sail fishing in the Gulf Coast. Do you do you guys do any of that stuff? I saw the, the cold motion. I can't remember where they're from, but they had some good, 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 uh, good white marlin, white or just regular overall mixed bag bill fishing in the, uh, um, I can't remember where they're from. But do you know that, that boat, the cold motion? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, um, Ryan Easterling uh, run, uh, runs it. Um, they're from, I think the boat, the owners are from Mobile maybe, but the boat stays in Orange Beach here in Alabama. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's actually, Ryan, the captain, is, um, 
he fished a trip with me this year on my boss's uh, business partner boat, and we caught a few fish. And um, our late summers, like August, September, even October, can be pretty. I mean, not what you guys get, but I mean, decent white marlin fishing, yeah. and you know, mixed bag, like you say, just mostly whites and a sail and a blue mixed in here or there. You know, some dorados and maybe a wado or something. But uh, it was uh, it was pretty good this for us. It was pretty good this summer. Um, I guess for about a six week stretch, you could go out there and you know get you six or eight shots and you know so whatever you did fishing. with that. Yeah, you know, on day trips, you know, you're running 40 miles, 30, 40 miles. Um, oh, wow. We had, yeah, yeah, pretty close. Yeah. yeah. So we, we had one tournament. We, I think we caught eight, eight out of like 11, you know, and pretty decent. So, and that's just, that's not, that's pretty much switching up your entire operation, you know, going, yeah. going dead bait trolling and you're fishing. You're not, you're yeah. not fishing on a, on a rig. You're just going fishing yeah. on the bottom fishing. or something like that. Yeah, and we don't have a ton of bottom structure. Um, mm -hmm. We've got some areas like the nipple, the elbow, the spur. Uh, the spur is a is a, a decent canyon, um, but the rest of it's just kind of like edges on the hundred fathom line that aren't you know. There's really not much to it, but uh, you know, it's, you're just looking at your Hiltons or Roths or something and finding you know good altimetry or currents and fishing an area and um, you know you get a bite kind of hanging out there and working it and trying to make the best out of it, but. Uh, it can be good. I think it's better than um, than we give it credit for. I just don't think we have the the guys up here doing it like like you guys on the East Coast do it. Um, you know, and, and you, you know we'll have a one or two boats fish a day versus a fleet of boats, and it's kind of hard to get on the group of fish and stay pinpointed yeah, yeah. on them. You know, um, like you said, it's vast vast amount of water, and it's kind of hard to pinpoint the fish and stay stay located. But you know, it's this year was probably the best year I remember. In, in quite a while. Um, That's pretty cool. Yeah. And yeah. is it like, it's kind of, is it a welcome change for you guys when you do that? Just because it's not what you typically do? 100%. I mean, that's my favorite yeah. kind of fishing. I, I, I would, yeah. I mean, I'm, we're good at live baiting, but I would much rather get a teaser bite than anything. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's one of the reasons I took the job that I'm on now is um, the boat, the cheeseburger, they travel quite a bit or I have in the past. And that's our plan is to do some traveling and they've been more of a, you know, a less live bait and more of the trolling type, teaser fishing, dink bait fishing, dredge fishing. So looking forward yeah, so to doing some of that. Yeah. So, you know, I've been waiting to ask, uh, I mean, obviously it ha it's the same boat. Uh, I mean, I've seen the boat. I, I mean, I've spent some time in Long Island and I know that, that boat always passed through Long Island and head straight to St. Thomas every year for a long time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm sure, you know, I know yeah, that's guys. the plan. We're supposed to be in uh boat Harbor May 1st and stay there all of May fish the skips tournaments and, or the, the shootout anyways, and maybe go around and do the uh, Walker's tournament. If we can get in, we're on the waiting list for that. And then we're going to go down to Long Island and base out of there for June, uh, fish down the Southern Bahamas a little bit. And then either St. Thomas for July, August, September, maybe October, or go straight to the DR. Not sure yet. Kind of weighing our options there, um, you know, with the, the whole BVI thing and having to clear customs and going over to scrub and staying for a week. And yeah, yeah. You know, there's just, I don't know. We're trying to figure it. We're just, figuring out what we're going to do there. But. It's got to, it's got to let up a little bit here at some point. Yeah. yeah. Oh, cool. I'll be, I'll, we'll be in long too for, I mean, we'll be in the Abacos and long for that same okay. time. So. Okay. What, what boat are you going to be on there? Uh, 58 Weaver. Okay. Uh, it's going to be called wire transfer. Wire transfer. Okay. I can't keep up with you, man. You're on a, the sailfish boats and the, <laughs> everything. I mean, I don't know what you, you know, <laughs> I always seem um, like you're on some other boat. Yeah, well, hopefully this one for a bit. I got you. Cool. How the boat, I got to ask, Miles, how'd that boat get the name Cheeseburger? Is he like a beef guy? So they, no, no. He uh, he he had a big business and sold it, made a bunch of money or whatever. And then they um, they got into the restaurant business. So they got a bunch of Shaggy's restaurants all over the Gulf Coast. And I don't know how they come up with Cheeseburger, but the, the big boat's <laughs> Cheeseburger, the little boat's a Quarter Pounder. I think there's a French fry in there somewhere. I mean... It's pretty funny. It's fun. um, awesome. Yeah, it's so a cool I, boat. We had to we had to do a ton of work to it, but it's it's going to be. Pretty yeah, what you guys done. What'd you guys do to it? Uh, rebuilt both motors, so we had to cut the deck out and the bulkhead, pull them out. Um, two new sea keepers, sonar, bow thruster, uh, engine room vent deals. The uh, the Delta T mist eliminators, you know. So the vents on this boat were just kind of open, and salt water would come in and get all over everything and kind of a bad design but anyways we fixed that um new flooring new headliner um 
what else? I mean, just a laundry list of stuff. I mean, it's been, like I said, almost nine months now. So wow. you said paint the boat too? No, we didn't paint the boat. We're planning on doing that after our, our little trip here. Um, All right. Take it to South Florida and do a paint job there. So it needs a, it needs a paint job. Mechanically, it's going to be good, but you know, it needs, it needs to be painted. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's a lot of, a lot of stuff going in the 60 foot boot. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, got it's a, 60 feet, right? Yep. 60 foot. Gotcha. Yep. Yep. How's that? How's that? Do you, do you walk them running a little smaller boat than that big Viking? Or? No, that thing's a- Man, I honestly, I'm kind of looking forward to a little bit simpler boat. Um, yeah. I mean, that, that, those Vikings were great. Those big Vikings, especially for the Gulf. I mean, the long overnight trips and having all the fuel and the speed. And, you know, we, we dealt with Galati and those guys are great customer support, you know, and the boats were always in their warranty. So just, Hey man, got a problem. You call them up and, but I'm looking forward to something a little simpler, you know, not doing software updates all the time and rebooting this and yeah. I'm going to be careful. <laughs> 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 so, yeah i mean every boat's a compromise so yeah for sure you know, for sure those, those big vikings are you know anymore that's a 68 72 is like they're just popping a new one out every week that's not yep. even, like it's a massive boat but it's like it, in the in the grand perspective of what's being built these days it's, it's really pretty normal yeah you know, you yeah you i don't know i don't think i'd want much more than a 72 I just you kind of give up a little bit of maneuverability a little bit you know yeah. Especially the big sea keeper in the back, and if it, your aft tank's full of fuel, you just just can't get after him like you like to. Yeah, so. oh, cool, man. That's, uh, well, it's going to be dialed in. Hopefully, hopefully. Yep. How's that going? I mean, that's got to be that's never fun. That sort of sort of time in the boatyard. It's the 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 things that people don't don't talk about. You know. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple times along this process of I'm like, man, what did I get myself into? You know, like just it just seems like things come to a standstill, like nothing's getting done. But it really is. I mean, there's plenty of getting done. You just don't see it. You know, there's you know they work an offsite or whatever it is. But you know, last since we put the boat in the water a couple of weeks ago, and since the boat's been in the water, it's been nice because I can go down the boat and do actual boat work. You know, just the wax and i've never been so happy to wax or wash a boat you know it's like man it's just like a relief to go to go to work every day do what i'm supposed to do do my boat chores and just be able to do normal boat stuff so it's kind of nice yeah absolutely cool man anthony you got anything um yeah we had we got to do the question about what, oh yeah, yeah what kind of what kind of what keeps you going miles you know you guys fish those insane tournaments where you're out there for you know a month and a half never sleeping or anything like that what is there a certain day you know you're like oh man like that was that day was the reason why if we try to we keep on doing you know, you know i keep on doing this or we keep on doing this like maybe a day you guys caught four or five big ones around a rig or something like that, that you know you have to re- revert back to when when fishing's slow and you're you know you're halfway to mexico yeah i mean there's been you know Quite a few of them. I mean, just being competitive is fun, and you know, coming yeah. up with a plan and executing it. I mean, that's you know, when you when you do your your homework and you sit there and you're like, all right, we're going to go here. The current's going to be this direction. And, you know, this is the kind of bait we're going to catch because you know, when it's this time of year, and you do it, and it works out just like you think it's going to. That's I mean, that's rewarding in itself. Yeah. Um, you know, that's probably the biggest thing is just like coming up with a plan and executing that gets me going. Like, I just I I just love that shit. Like. You know, especially when it works out like you think it's going to work out, you know, when it doesn't and then you have a good plan B or plan C and you can fall back on that and still do well, you know, that's, you know, I really enjoy that part of it too, you know, yeah. being able to that's adapt cool. during the tournament and, and still do well, you know. I like that you make a good point about coming up with a plan and, you know, making it, sometimes making it go your way your way it's a nice it's a nice feeling to, to 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 get that get it going like that yeah makes you feel like you kind of know what you're doing yeah <laughs> yeah yeah because there's a lot of days you're just like i've been working at this all my life and then it's just i i could have started yesterday for for all anybody else knows, yeah. You know? yeah yep sometimes it's like that yeah and it helps when you've done well and you got a you know the crew and an owner that that have confidence in you and then are like, man, man, whatever you say, we're with you, you know, no second guess and none of that mumbling in the cockpit. Oh, we should have done this or we should have done that. Or so-and-so is catching yeah. this, you know, that's shit's how, good. I mean, how long did that take you to like, Oh, so for example, like the born to run program, did that start off right away? Cause I know it didn't start off right away on my boat. <laughs> well, luckily I had a really good run before that. Yeah. The guys that fished with me, 
Um, I mean, they, they knew like a track record and it's funny. The first day we fished Marlin fished, um, Dana told me, he's like, All right, I got three goals this year. I want Lisa to catch a billfish. I want Lisa to catch a blue Marlin and I want to catch more than two in a day. So we ran out there, did a day trip. We caught three blue Marlin. She caught two of the three. <laughs> and he caught the third one and ran home. I said, yeah, of course, this is me being a smart ass. I said, you got any more goals for the year or what? Are we good? <laughs> so, I mean, that was just total luck. I mean, it didn't always work like that, but it did that day. So, um, but he was on board or the whole team was on board from day one. They were, they were good people. Yeah. How long did that take for you, Nick, on your, you know, on the show time? Did, did you have to earn that or did you just, everybody was like, oh, we're with you. You're Nick Carullo and we're going where you're going. I mean, we don't care if it's a hurricane. Uh, yeah. I mean, well, most of us, we, the year before that, we had already, we fished on another boat, pretty much the same team. And we had a, we had an incredible year that year. And that, that kind of operation came to a, a closing out of nowhere for everybody after a mm -hmm. great season, which was, you know, awkward. Uh, but so we kind of jumped on the show time and, you know, basically it was the same crew. So it was just like, well, we know what to do. Let's execute it and do it again. And yeah, sure enough, we had another incredible year on a different boat, back to back years. So it was, it was, it was a special two years for sure. Yeah. So they're kind of with you. It's kind of already, already, you know, you didn't, you know, it's just nice when you have that. Yeah. We didn't, yeah, yeah. I didn't have that. I was really young and inexperienced when I started on this boat and my guys had done a lot of fishing before. And it just took a long time to kind of gain their confidence. You know? Yeah. And thankfully, I, I earned that finally. So now when I have a crazy idea and I want to run 100 miles, you know, sure. No, go for it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm it always going, you know, when I, No, go ahead, Miles. Go ahead. I'm always kind of, you know, when I have that crazy idea or we're not, things aren't working out like I'm thinking, you know, I'll go down there in the cockpit and sit down there and just have a brainstorm with everybody. It's like, look, these are options. We can stay here and keep doing this and maybe get lucky and get a big bite or we can pick up and burn a couple hours and run 60 miles, get in some different water and, and do something. And, and I mean, I can't ever remember a time that the boss was like, no, I don't think so. Or, you know, anybody was like, no, I think that's a bad idea. They're always, whatever you think, Cap, you know, which is cool, man. When you got, when you got that confidence behind you, you know, from your team, yeah. it, it means a lot. Yeah, it, it really does, man. And yeah, I've been had the same experiences kind of go down there or I don't go down there because I'm not, not that far. I just yell down and say, this is what's going on. You want a guys going to try something? And you know, more often than not, they're kind of with us, with me. So off we go. Yeah, uh, it makes making a move uh, a little bit more, I don't know about enjoyable, but I guess stress-free when the guys kind of believe in the move you're going to make. Yeah, you know? it's, it's a lot easier when you're, you know, when you're just not catching anything versus like, oh, uh, we gotta, we gotta maybe do a little bit better. You know, there's a difference between bobbing around, you're trolling around, and there's really nothing going on, and you're not seeing it going on. And for, for you know, especially for you, Nick, you could be in one spot, but it's not the, the spike you need to be in the win. So it's, yeah. it's kind of. We fished this tournament last week, and right in the morning, like nobody was catching anything, and we're like, all right, shit, we're we're in the wrong spot. But then we're like, well. No one's really catching anything. Maybe we, maybe we should just be a little patient. And there was like, <laughs> there was like, twenty boats at this one area, and we, we like, we did like, a, we were leaving to go fish somewhere else, and then we just did a huge donut and came right back to the same spot. I've done, I've done that so many times, man. It's crazy. I pick up and start running. I cut, man. This is not, this is not feeling like it, like I thought it would be. I just turn around <laughs> yeah. and go right back. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, wow, everyone's, just, those, everyone's staring at us, just laughing at us. Like, what are these guys doing? Yeah. Sometimes those power moves just kind of re-energize the crew too. You know, you just bring yeah. everything in, re reset out. And everybody's, you know, got, you know, I don't know, refocused, re-energized and their confidence levels higher. And I don't know, sometimes I think that, that in itself, even if you only moved from one rig to the next, which is, you know, six, seven miles away, it just, just that pick up and move and reset yeah, yeah. out and all that makes a difference. Absolutely. Yeah, it certainly does. Yeah. I don't know what it is. It's like the, at least for us, you know, the fresh baits going out and stuff. It, I don't know if it catches an eye or something, but a lot of times it just seem to get bit pretty quick within a... As soon as you're setting out. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, what the hell? It's like the fish was waiting for us. Mm -hmm. A lot of times too, we'll be, there'll be three or four boats live baiting around a rig and somebody will be blasting in from offshore or whatever. And, you know, we've been there hours 
And like I said, as soon as they set out on their own, I mean, it's like, yeah, what, I mean, what the I hell, feel like, you know? Yeah. I feel like they're already there. You know, I've, I've hooked a couple, a fair amount of white Marlins with the first bait in the water. Yeah. And I just feel like they, they hear that and they just, they're just looking around and mm-hmm. they're there. So how do you, Miles, do you have a way of eliminating, you know, you get the fish a pretty, pretty, uh, condensed area on on a rig you know like how do you have a process that you go through when you get to a rig you're like oh it should look like this and when it doesn't you're just like too gone yeah sometimes and that's bit me in the ass a few times like you you know i'm looking at my charts and i and i I run whatever for you know 200 miles to get to this rig and i get there and it doesn't (laughs) look like what i think it's gonna look like and then i kind of hit the panic button too soon um but you know most time you get there and and if it does look like i think it's gonna look i'm like confidence levels high like i'll stay there longer pound it out waiting on yeah. that bite time that we talked about earlier you know and with the sonar that's helped a little bit because you know now i'm maybe marking some fish but not getting bites but you know i know they're there it's easier to hang out and stay a while um but when i get to somewhere and it doesn't look like i think it's going to look it, it just kind of it messes with me messes with my head and i oh, yeah. you know hit the painting button and blast off and go somewhere else and you know you then right where you and then right where you left from, they start catching them. Yeah, you get into the, the tournament, you hear like so and so caught. You know, they they released three there, and caught a five hundred pounder. It's like, ah, you know, the current wasn't what I thought it was going to be, or the whatever it may be. You know, just different factors that get in your head. Yeah, so. that we it happens. Like we'll be sitting at a spot sometimes and we're all sitting there like, all right, no one's getting bit. And it's like, we were like, I'll like look at JC and we'll be like, well, if we leave, they're going to start catching them. (laughs) And then like, sure. But like if somebody else leaves, we're like, all right, now we're going to start catching them. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. That's funny. It's crazy. Cool. Well, I I got, I got nothing. That was really cool. Miles. Nothing else. That was, it's really interesting. We're in three different, three different, fisheries around the united states but we can pretty pretty much still understand it kind of the same way it's so cool to be able to relate to people like that yeah it's it's you know it's fish enough to say that a lot of people you know they just i'm looking forward to traveling a little bit and trying to fish in new places and you know see if i can do it you know i don't know see i'm sure there's gonna be a learning curve and just see if i can kind of hang in there with the you know the, the guys that have been going there a while Figuring out a new yeah. fishery, new style of fishing for me. Not this is not one hundred percent new, but just different. You know. Yeah. Um, looking forward to it. Yeah, nice. me too. Well, I look forward to uh, running into you over there, Miles. Sounds good. Cool. Well, thanks. Thank thanks, you very Miles. much, Miles. Yeah. That was fun. Right, thanks for joining right, us, man.